check it out. Sevastopol is in my port. Now, technically, that is a rental. I'm gonna have to buy this ship with research points just like everyone else, but Wargaming let me borrow one so I could make this video. This ship was announced on November 7th, 2021, alongside Forrest Sherman and Canarius. Both of those boats have been out for a very long time. In fact, Forrest Sherman came out back in March, and finally, Sevastopol is coming to the armory, and you'll be able to purchase it for research points. Now, World of Warships is no stranger to powerful Tier 10 Soviet cruisers. Moskva, Stalingrad, and Petropavlovsk are powerful, heavy cruisers that are very tanky, they've got excellent radar, and they get a lot of play in both randoms and competitive modes in our favorite video game. I assume this is your favorite video game, otherwise this is a really nerdy video for you to be watching. <laughs> anyway, for some reason, Sevastopol has been added as yet another very heavy cruiser in the Soviet line. And that got me thinking, which one is best? And is that even a legitimate question to be asking? During the last nine months of development, testing, and waiting for this ship to come out, I got very excited about Sevastopol, particularly when I read a dev blog a while back that announced a speed boost and an insanely long heel, the likes of which we have never seen in World of Warships to date. That combination of high mobility with the speed boost and a long running zombie heel seemed like an interesting mix, something that would offer up a unique gameplay experience and be very different from anything we've seen in a Russian heavy up to this point. Now, each of these ships is available for a different currency. Petro is a tech tree ship. Just get some credits and XP and work your way up the tree and you can get Petro Pavlovsk. Moskva is available for coal, Stalingrad for steel, and finally Sevastopol for research points. Arguably, Sevastopol is the hardest ship in that list to unlock, although players who don't earn steel through playing ranked or clan battles might rightly disagree with that statement. Given the relative difficulty in obtaining Sevastopol, you might assume that she is the most powerful ship here. But is she? My name is Clyde, and this is a Clyde Plays Deep Dive. Let's get into it. In today's video, we're going to perform a stat-by-stat -stat comparison to some of the key attributes of these four Soviet heavies. Now, ships are fairly complicated entities in this game, and so it never quite feels like we're comparing apples to apples. What? I'm going to try to be as fair as I can in the comparison, but if you disagree with me, like that's totally okay. Just drop a comment below with your thoughts, and I'll try to get back to you personally. I'm really excited to engage with you guys in some discourse about this crazy new ship, but some of this stuff is going to come down to a matter of opinion, and I want to know what yours is. I've divided the statistics of these ships into five major categories. Survivability, sensors, anti-aircraft, maneuverability, and finally, main battery guns. For every attribute in a category, we'll award one point to the ship with the best stat. In the event of a tie, both ships will get points as long as the tying ships were better than at least one other ship. If all four ships were the same, nobody gets any points. Finally, I'll select the ship that I think was best in that category overall. This might not always be the ship that scored the most points within that category, and if it isn't, I'll try to explain why I feel that way. For each category win, we'll award the ship one point. When we're done, I'll tally up all the scores and put them up on the screen so you guys can see them all, and I'll also include the scores without the bonus points for category wins. That way, if you disagree with uh, my category winners, you can take a look at the raw comparisons without seeing the extra points for winning a given category. Oh, I almost forgot. I created a special score screen so we can keep track of things and you guys can see the ships as they're getting points. Let's go over there now. Hey, we made it. So we've got the scores right over this way and I've got a chalkboard up above in case I need to put any numbers on the screen for you. Without further ado, let's get into talking about survivability. First, I'd like to talk with you guys about hit points. Stalingrad gets a point for having the most hit points, 72,450. That is over 7,000 more hit points than the next ship, which is Moskva. Detectability by sea, the point goes to Sevastopol. It starts off at 13.6 and with a captain perk and an upgrade module, you can bring that all the way down to 11.0, which is almost as good as like a US cruiser. It's, it's absurdly low for a ship the size of Sevastopol. Moscow and Stalingrad are both in the mid 17s to start with Petropavlovsk being at 13, excuse me, 15.3 kilometers. So none of them can get anywhere near as stealthy as Sev. Detectability by air goes to Petropavlovsk at 9.1 kilometers, 9.4 for Moskva, 11 for Stalingrad, and 10.4 for Sev. They're all kind of within a stone's throw of each other, but Petro takes the point for that. 
Next, I want to talk about the amount of hit points that these ships can get back when they use a hull repair consumable, as well as the percentage of citadel damage they can recover. Petropavlovsk, Moskva, and Stalingrad are all pretty standard fare when it comes to this uh, attribute, if you will. They can heal 14% of their total hit points with a, with a hull repair charge, and they can heal 33% of citadel damage. Sevastopol, on the other hand, this is kind of its party piece. It can heal a total of 45% of its total hit points every time it uses a hull repair charge, and it can heal 50% of citadel damage. Now that 45% doesn't come on real quickly. It takes a 90 second duration to get all those hit points back. Compare this with something like Conqueror, which can heal 40% of its hit points in just 20 seconds. And you see kind of what I mean when I say it's a zombie heal. Sevastopol is slowly chunking back health all the time. And if you're taking damage at the same time, it can seem like you're not making any progress but it can also seem like your enemies aren't making any progress either. If you're on fire or flooding or taking lots of secondary fire, but you're just slowly getting health back the whole time, it can really enhance the survivability of the ship. Obviously, Sevastopol is gonna take this point. All four ships come with three hull repair charges, and thus nobody gets a point for having more or less of those. The next category to talk about is the number of hit points you recover per second. The bigger the number, the faster you're gonna recover, which is gonna let you bounce back from being beat up quickly. Stalingrad takes the cake here with 362 hit points, Moskva coming in at 327 in second place with Sevastopol at 313, and the worst being Petropavlovsk at 279 hit points. Following that, we've got a ratio of your repair, your whole repair duration divided by the cooldown or the reload time of that consumable. Sevastopol actually has the best ratio here, which is kind of crazy considering its reload is 180 seconds. But because it has a 90 second heal, it's got a ratio of 0 0.5. Petro, Moskva, and Stalingrad all have a 28 second hull repair with an 80 second reload base, which gives them a 0 0.35 ratio. Armor is a little bit difficult to distill down to just a comparable integer or a single number. So let's go over to the client and take a look at what we can there to compare the armor profiles of these four ships. So I'm gonna bounce around ship to ship here. We'll start with Sevastopol, partly because I think it's got some weaknesses that we should make sure that we discuss. So if we expand the armor layout here, we can see all of the colors, which tell us how thick the armor is everywhere. Let's start with the superstructure. This is a relatively long superstructure. Although it's not particularly wide, all of this is going to be relatively farmable with smaller guns, those from light cruisers, destroyers, and every battleship, every heavy cruiser, every ship in the game has some armor that is penable by small guns, and that is this superstructure here on the Sevastopol. It's not terribly different from the other ships in this category. However, a couple of things are different. Take a look at the bow here. This is all 25 millimeter plating on the bow, whereas all three of the other ships in this category have an icebreaker right here, and we're gonna take a look at that when we get to the other ships. Also, the deck of Sevastopol is only 30 millimeters. That's not as thick as any other ship in this category. I think Petro is 40, and both Moskva and Stalingrad have a 50 millimeter deck. That's, uh, that's not gonna help you when you're resisting high arcing fire like that from American cruisers that are kind of away at some range. Um, we can take a look at the side plating here. 230 millimeters is probably not too far off from the other guys, but we'll take a look when we get a little closer. Let me jump over to Stalingrad. We'll look at the basics that we've already looked at here. Stalingrad has a pretty big and fairly wide, eh, maybe it's not much wider, but it's got a pretty big superstructure, pretty farmable, pretty burnable, just like Sevastopol. It also also has an icebreaker up here, a 50 millimeter strip on the bow, which is not present on Sevastopol. 25 mil up and down, which is pretty common, but check this out, a 50 millimeter deck, 20 millimeters thicker than what we saw on Sevastopol. Out back, we've also got a 50, 50 millimeter strip on the aft end of the ship. On Sev, we had 230 mils here. Here we've got 180 and 180. But now let's start, uh, we're gonna come back and peel away some layers here. First, we'll go over to Moskva. Let's take a quick look at bow, deck, and superstructure. Moskva has a very large superstructure. It's also very tall and relatively farmable. It's a big rectangle. And when you take a look at Petro's, 
In fact, we'll click on that right now. When we take a look at Petros, look at this darn thing. There's a hole here. It's very low profile. It's actually kind of hard to hit this. Petro has the best superstructure of any of these ships, and that's one of the reasons why people thought of it as stronger than Stalingrad and, uh, and Moskva when it first came out. It's a lot less easy to farm. It's relatively short. Look how skinny it is. The superstructure is just much smaller on this ship than it is on the others. Um, we'll take a quick look while we're here. We do have an icebreaker, 50 millimeters, and a 25 millimeter bow. The deck plating is 40 millimeters, and we do have this strip on the back as well. 180 millimeters in this little rectangle, or trapezoid or whatever, and 50 mil here with a 25 millimeter aft end of the ship. If we go back to Moskva, which I think is where we just were, uh, 25 millimeters, millimeters, 50 millimeters. We've got a 50 millimeter deck. Again, that large superstructure, relatively farmable, but a pretty great deck uh, on that ship as well. Let's go back to Sevastopol. We'll start peeling away some of these layers and then we'll check each of the other ships out as well. Let's get rid of the guns and the barbettes. Uh, we'll get rid of the bow and we'll get rid of the stern. We'll pull off the torpedo protection as well. We'll get rid of the superstructure and honestly, let's take off the auxiliary room armor as well. First thing I want to point out to you is look at how long this citadel is. In fact, if we just have the citadel, this is how long the citadel is. Note the area here below the gun and how this citadel reaches out in front of the barrels and in front of the back barrel as well. Now, let's go take a look at Stalingrad. Stalingrad citadel stops way back here at the at the back of the barrels instead of at the front of the barrels same thing in the back we've also got a little bit of an angle here whereas the the citadel on the sevastopol is flat check that out so that angle is going to make it a little bit better when you're bow tanking the shells are going to have to come in at you they're going to be better off sort of coming in at an angle rather than trying to shoot right, th right through your bow. Uh, whereas we've got a flat panel here on Sevastopol, plus you don't have the icebreaker. So if somebody can overmatch your bow, overmatch that 25 millimeter armor, they'll be able to punch straight through that and then maybe go right through this athwart ship armor at the front of the Sevastopol. Whereas on something like uh, Stalingrad, which we just looked at, not only do you have a, a 50 millimeter icebreaker up front, remember this little guy, but if we turn that off, we have just a little bit of angle here at the front of the Citadel, which is gonna help out. Also, like I said, it's shorter, it's narrower, it's smaller. So you're gonna have to punch through something here that's covered in your side plating rather than through the side of the bow to get into that, uh, that armor like you can in Sevastopol. For example, again here, if we put the bow back on, oh, I guess, I, excuse me, I, I misspoke. I thought this wrapped over that section, but it doesn't. Anyhow, we're seeing a huge citadel that's not as well angled for bow tanking, uh, and it's just easy to hit. And I can tell you from experience playing Sevastopol, this ship cannot tank when you're giving up too much broadside. Now that's also true of Moskva. It's kind of true of Stalingrad and Petro as well, but there's just so much more Citadel to hit here. And this fore and aft section is relatively lightly armored. And I found that this ship was a lot more vulnerable to AP fire than Stalingrad and uh, Petro were. Let's take a look at Moskva real quick. We'll take a look at its Citadel, just like we saw with um, with Stalingrad, right? The Citadel stops at the back of the barrels. It doesn't extend out here in front of the guns like it does on, on Sevastopol. And same thing out back. We've also got some angle here on the Citadel. This is 170 millimeter armor up front. We've got uh, 135 millimeter armor out back. Um, and if we go back and compare with Stalingrad, uh, Stalingrad is only 140 millimeters up front and 125 millimeters out back. So a little bit better armor on Moskva once you get back behind uh, the bow armor as well. If we take a look at Petropavlovsk, let's take a look at Petro. Now look at this. This appears to be even slightly short. Eh, maybe it's about the same. It's hard to say, but it's definitely not as large as the uh, as the Sevastopol armor. Also, it seems like it sits relatively low in the ship. Take a look at this. Look how low Petro is in the water. They did recently just raise this ship a little bit, but look how low this is. And let's go compare it with Stalingrad. I feel like Stalingrad sits just a little bit higher in the water and so does the Citadel. What about Moskva? It sits just a little bit up. I don't know. It, it might not be a huge deal, but it's definitely sort of 
there. We do see a low citadel here in the Sevastopol, so that is one thing in its favor. Going back to Petropavlovsk, uh, we'll take a look at this armor. 170 millimeters up front. It does have a little bit of an angle as well, so that's going to be a benefit. This section down here is just 19 millimeters, but it's very low underwater, so probably that's okay. And you know, if you've ever bow tanked in, uh, in Petro, you know just how strong um, it can be at that. 170 millimeters out back, which is better than what we saw in both Stalingrad and on Moskva. So that's nice there with, again, a, a light uh, 19 millimeter athwart ship armor there on the back of the ship. So I, all in all, these shorter citadels are going to be a lot better off than Sevastopol is. Sevastopol also having that that 30 millimeter deck and that larger superstructure. I mean, I really have to say that I think the the best ships here in terms of this are probably going to be Petropavlovsk and Stalingrad at tanking most of that armor. And Petro really slightly edges out Stalingrad because of the smaller superstructure. Uh, but I think I'm going to give a point to both Petro and Stalingrad here and deny the point from Moskva because of Moskva's blap ability from the side, um, as well as denying the point from Sevastopol for simply not being as tanky as these other ships in, uh, in the uh, Russian fleet. Next, I'd like to talk about the fire durations of these ships. Petro and Moskva are not considered supercruisers. They're just heavy cruisers. And as a result, they have 30 second fires and 40 second floods. Stalingrad and Sevastopol, on the other hand, are considered supercruisers and they have 60 second fires. It's one of the reasons why you see Moskva in the higher leagues of play in clan battles and you don't see Stalingrad. You do see Petro and you probably won't see Sevastopol. We'll probably talk more about that at the end of the video. Because this fire duration is a real, real pain, especially when you've got a coordinated team, a clan battles team, a tournament team, what have you, it makes those ships difficult to choose because of those long fires, especially given the fact that Sevastopol has limited uses of damage control party. So I've got to give the points to Petro and Moskva on this one for having shorter fires. Everybody's got the same floods, but we just lump those into one category. Stalingrad and Sevastopol will not get points for fire and flood duration. Petro, Stalingrad, and Sevastopol all scored very well in this category. So who takes home the category win and the coveted bonus point? Well, Sev easily has the worst armor in this group, but I think the zombie heal more than makes up for it. Sev also has a limited usage damage control party. In other words, you can only use so many charges, but if a fire lasts 60 seconds and your heal lasts 90 seconds, I just learned to let them burn. In preparing for this video, I played a battle where I took over 120,000 damage and I ended the match with 34,000 hit points left on my ship. This means that when I left port with 62,600 points, the enemy nearly killed me twice and my health bar was still half full at the end of the match. It took me several battles to figure out how to do this though. I will say it took some practice, but once I learned to combine that healing capacity with my 11 kilometer C detection range so I could hide from enemies, it was like I became unkillable. No, you're not gonna be able to do it every match, but it's a skill that you'll need to learn if you're gonna make Sev last for uh, the duration of the battles. And you can do it. I actually think the survivability category goes to Sev despite its poor armor because I think healing is now your armor. Now, you might think that all Soviet cruisers are created equal when it comes to sensor loadout, but you'd be wrong. Sevastopol has no radar at all, but it can be equipped with sonar if you decide to leave defensive AA at home. Petro, Moskva, and Stalingrad all get one point for having a 12 kilometer radar. And uh, Sevastopol, as I said, has no radar, so no point for Sev. Moskva gets an extra point for having the longest radar in terms of duration. It lasts for 30 seconds. And I know we're not talking about guns just yet, but because it has the longest radar and also the fastest reloading guns, that means that Moskva is the best for getting DD kill conversions when you use your radar without help from your team. Um, Petro, Moskva, and Sevastopol all have the same sonar, sonar equipment on board. It can detect a ship at 5 kilometers and a torpedo at 3.5. So all three of those ships are going to get a point, whereas Stalingrad gets no points because it has no acoustics at all. Uh, the category winner here is going to be Moskva. So Moskva is going to take home an extra point because it's got the best radar of the bunch and an equally competitive sonar with the best ships in the class. Anti-aircraft capability is sometimes pretty difficult to compare in World of Warships because 
there are a lot of factors that are not AA guns that affect your experience when you're trying to fend off airplanes. I think for this category, what I'm gonna do is just put my comparison chart up on the screen, and I'm gonna tell you the scores that I gave each ship. Petro gets four points, Moskva gets three, Stalingrad five, and Sevastopol only gets one point. Now, who wins the category? By all rights, Stalingrad has the best AA metrics. It has better numbers than Petro, and it even has a better rating inside the World of Warships client. Petro has a rating of 83, Stalingrad has a rating of 86. But in practice, it feels like Petro is better able to shrug off air attacks than Stalingrad. Why? Well, I think it's because Petro has a smaller superstructure than Stalingrad. It's narrower and it's shorter in height. And that means that Petro is protected by more of its 40 millimeter deck than its 16 millimeter superstructure. It's more likely to shatter more ordnance than the larger, wider superstructure that exists on Stalingrad. Secondly, because a lot of airstrikes can cause fires and Stalingrad is a supercruiser, it has 60 second fires, whereas Petro only has 30 second fires. Sevastopol also suffers from those 60 second fires, but Petro and Moskva are considered normal cruisers like we talked earlier, and thus they only have 30 second fires. These two factors kind of result in Stalingrad having better AA, but having a worse experience fighting airplanes than Petro Pavlovsk has. For that reason, I'm gonna give this category win to Petro, even though Stalingrad technically has better AA, Petro is gonna survive air attacks better and thus takes the category win and the extra point. Although maneuverability is not considered to be a hallmark of Soviet heavy cruisers in World of Warships, the ability to redeploy to the other side of the map is incredibly valuable once you've won your side of the match. Typically, our Soviet cruisers are gonna pull up next to an island, use their radar to stiff arm people and keep them out of a cap, and sling large caliber AP shells at enemy cruisers. But like I said, once you're done with that, you've gotta get moving. Maneuverability can help you avoid or escape from hairy situations too. And it might even help you get into a position that is favorable to capitalize on an enemy ship's mistake. Stalingrad gets a point for having the fastest speed in this category. Moskva wins the rudder shift competition, and Sevastopol has the tightest turning circle at just 980 meters. I say just because it'll make Sevastopol feel better, but really those are all pretty terrible scores because these ships are huge. Sevastopol also has a speed boost, which comes with four charges and adds a monster 20% to the ship's top speed for 45 seconds. I equipped mine with a coal engine boost module from the armory, which makes it last for almost 65 seconds, and then it recharges in just under 60 seconds in my configuration. And you can do this a lot. You can drive around at high speed a lot. So Sev is really pretty maneuverable. It's very strange for a big Soviet cruiser like Sevastopol to move like that, but it's pretty fun to do. So you can kind of run and gun with this thing. The maneuverability category goes to Sevastopol, which gets an extra point for winning the category. Finally, we are gonna talk about the guns. I know a lot of you, especially if you've been waiting for Sevastopol to come out, have been very interested in this part of the discussion. You might've even skipped here and I wouldn't, uh, I wouldn't hold it against you, frankly. It wouldn't bother me much. Sevastopol gets a point for having the biggest guns of these four ships. It's got 380 millimeter guns, and these guns are incredible. They make you feel like you're driving around a battleship and you can pen just about anything, except that you can't. You gotta remember, we are at tier 10, and at tier 10, we've got ships with guns like 457s, 460s, 508s, 510s, and, le and let's honestly not even forget the 406s, right? 380s are smaller than all of those, and we talk about how those guns at times feel like they can't pen the things we want them to pen. So if you're shooting your 380s and you're expecting 457 performance, like I was, frankly, when I first took the boat out, I was expecting to be able to shoot anything at any angle and get some damage. And there were times when I would get 1000 damage, I would shatter shells, I would bounce shells, I would get 3000 damage. And I was like, come on, man, I got 380s, what's going on? They're still just 380s. Once I realized that they were 380s and I, could, I needed to shoot at targets that were appropriate to shoot at with 380s and look for good angles and things like that, I started to be a lot more satisfied with what was going on because I was using the guns better to do jobs that they were intended for. You can slap cruisers, you can blap broadside battleships, and you can get more overpens than you probably want, honestly, on some of those targets. But 
I was just being overconfident with those 380s before. Once I got comfortable with them, I stopped getting over pens, I started getting pens, and I started doing real, real work with these things. These guns are killer for a cruiser, but don't think that you're in a battleship because you're just not. It's not as tanky as a battleship, and it doesn't hit as hard as a battleship. Okay, next category, gun count. To pay for those big guns, Sev only gets six guns, whereas Petro, Moskva, and Stalingrad all get nine guns. So each of those three ships gets a point here, and Sev does not get a point for gun count. Moskva has the best reload of any ship in the bunch, and so it gets a point for the best rate of fire. Uh, Moskva is also the DPM king. I, I made a combined category here, so we wouldn't have two points going for two different flavors of DPM, because that felt a little over, um, overly generous. Uh, but Moskva gets the point for DPM, thanks to having those fast-firing 220s. Um, overmatch is basically just a function of the gun caliber. So I didn't want to give a separate point for overmatch and a separate point for gun caliber. Uh, but because I think people are interested in this, I wanted to give the information. Uh, so no points are awarded for overmatch, but Petro and Moskva having 220s both have 15 millimeters of overmatch. Stalingrad has 21 millimeters of overmatch and Sev has 23 millimeters of overmatch. Stalingrad wins for the best range. It's got 20.4 kilometers, so we'll give a point for Stalingrad there. And the Sigma value goes to Stalingrad as well. Sigma is a measure of gun accuracy, so the larger the number, the better the accuracy, and Stalingrad's number is far and away the best in this category. It's 2.65, which is sort of absurd, uh, versus 2.05 for all three other ships. Honestly, any ship over two is considered pretty accurate. So Stalingrad's guns are absurdly accurate at 2.65. Um, she's gonna take the point for Sigma. 12 kilometer flight time is a metric that combines initial shell velocity with shell drag in order to give you a sense of how fast your shells are. Now faster shells are better because you're more likely to hit your target and your arcs will be flatter. Petro takes the point here with the fastest shells in our comparison with Sevastopol's 380s being the slowest. For dispersion, Moskva and Sev tie for the best dispersion numbers, and they'll both come away with a point in this category. This is really important for Sevastopol, which only has six guns, so it's going to be a lot more sensitive to dispersion than a nine-gun ship like Petro, Moskva, or Stalingrad. I think there's a little bit of room for argument in which ship has the best guns in this game, because I honestly think it's pretty situational. Um, I'm going to go and say that I think Stalingrad actually has the best guns in this category. You've got nine guns, which means your salvos are going to be very powerful. They're 305s, so you can pen or citadel pretty much anything if you've got an appropriate angle. And that 2.65 Sigma is fantastic. Moskva is great and actually won four points in this category. So, I mean, if you wanted to say that Moskva was the best one, I would understand that. However, I think in practice, Moskva's guns just don't quite have the punch that's required with the larger gun meta. Yes, Sevastopol has 380s, which really fit into that larger gun meta we've seen in the last couple of years as we've moved from 406s to 457s and 460s to 4, uh, 508s and 510s. But the 380s are not really that special at tier 10, so I kind of feel like I'd rather have nine 305s than six 380s if I was just shopping for guns and not thinking about the rest of the ship. So despite Moskva coming away with the most points and Sevastopol having the big 380s and Petro legitimately being a reasonable contender with the fastest shells out there, I'm gonna say that Stalingrad has the best guns in this comparison. If you disagree, let me know in the comments. I'd really love to hear your reasoning because I'm sure there's some really well thought out valid arguments for picking other ships, but I'm going with Stalingrad. Uh, let me know what you think down below. So which ship is best? Honestly, I was hoping this would be more conclusive, but I didn't really think that it would be. The winner in my comparison here is Stalingrad. Stalingrad came away with 14 points, uh, Moskva with 13 points, and Petro with 12, and Sevastopol with 11. If you disregard the category wins, the winner is still Stalingrad with 13 points, Moskva with 12, Petro with 11, and then Sevastopol. With nine. So the question I think a lot of you are probably asking yourselves right now is, should I get Sevastopol? I really don't know if I can answer that question for you, but I can tell you about whether or not I would get Sevastopol. I've got a stack of research points right now, um, and when this ship goes live, they're gonna take away my rental, um, and I'm gonna have to decide if I'm gonna buy it for myself. Um, for me, I like ships that are a little bit weird. Uh, if you hang out on my Twitch stream, you know that that is true. And I like ships that provide a unique game experience. 
There is no ship in World of Warships that has a weird zombie heal that lasts for a minute and a half and recharges for two or for what is it three minutes after that. If it had eight guns, it would be a no-brainer. Definitely go buy it for me. Um, I think I'm still going to get it. Like I said, it's a unique game experience you can't get in any other ship in the game. It's not significantly better or significantly worse than any of the super cruisers we compared it against, or I shouldn't say super cruisers, tier 10 Russian cruisers that we compared it against in this comparison. It's not that much better than Stalingrad or worse than Stalingrad. It's not that much better or worse than Moscow or Petro. It's kind of similar in, in capability, I think when you just look at all the numbers in the way that we did. My gameplay experience with it was pretty disappointed at first until I got used to the 380s and learned when I could and couldn't use them. And I also had to learn how to be careful when I approached the battle, how close I would get, because yes, I can heal forever, but I'm not healing that fast. And when that heal ends, I have a three minute wait before I can heal again. I need to be very smart about staying alive for three minutes. And that was hard for me to do at first, so that was frustrating. But once I overcame that, the ship became a lot more fun to play. Will Sevastopol be competitive for ranked or for clan battles? I don't really think so. Um, I think people are going to expect you to have a radar. You're not going to keep people out of a cap with Sevastopol. You're more going to kite and try to go for those big hits. Um, you might see it as a flanker because of speed. Could it do like what, what uh, Napoli is doing right now in clan battles? maybe, um, but the armor's really not that great. One of Napoli's hallmarks is the tankiness of that ship. Yes, you can recover with Sevastopol, but can you recover fast enough, right? You might just be better off to be in a Napoli and not take that damage in the first place because you're so tanky. Sevastopol, I think, is fun. I think it's unique. I don't know if it's going to have a home in competitive. I'd be really interested in your thoughts about that in the, in the comments below. So let me know what you think. Guys, thank you so much for watching this video. I really hope that it was useful for you. I hope that if, uh, if nothing else, it was entertaining. Maybe you're seriously thinking about getting Sevastopol. Maybe you're not. And maybe you just watch everything on YouTube and this came up next. But uh, if you liked what you saw today, please hit the follow button, share it with a friend. Um, if you want to hang out with us on Twitch, you can check us out at twitch.tv slash Live. We stream three nights a week over there and we'd love to have you there, three days a week. We'd love to have you join us over there. Um, of course, you can also join our Discord server, link in the description below, where we can keep the conversation going between streams and between YouTube videos. Until we see you next time, guys, please take care of each other. Be cool, be nice, and we'll see you in the next Battle Captains. Goodbye.